Yes, Father, we are so thankful that we can hear testimony after testimony about how good you are. Lord, I know many of the testimonies we've heard now come from people who cried out for a long time. You cried out from the depths of darkness sometimes even. But you're a God who never leaves us. You're a God who never forsakes us. And when we cry out, you do respond. In your perfect time, in your perfect way. And so Lord, we also want to come and pray with those who are still calling out. Whether it's for themselves, or whether it's for the brokenness they see in the ones they love, the lostness they see in the ones they love. Lord, we pray that this morning you will answer our prayers, that you will intervene and, and make right, and bring people back to you. Lord, that is our prayer, that we will see your grace and your mercy that is available and let us grab hold of it. We praise you for all of this in your wonderful name. Amen. We are today in our last sermon in the series on considering God, where we said we want to find strength and hope in who God is. We want to connect with God. We want to see who God is. We want to know who God is. And we want to connect with Him on that level. Now, obviously, we didn't look at all the attributes of God. We can sit there for until eternity and we will not cover everything about God. There is things about God's trinity, God's creativity, God's patience. So many things that you will learn when you go and spend time with God. When you sit with the Word and you spend time with God. But I hope that what we did here and what we discussed here made you more in awe of God. That your picture of God might have been very small. And that your picture of God has been enlarged to see that He is good and He's great and He's real. Now the last one we're going to look at today is the fact that God is merciful and gracious. Merciful and gracious. Now, we, we do them together because they are concepts that are often very intermingled in the Bible. They are often used together and often the Bible would say grace when it means grace and mercy. Or it would say mercy when it means grace and mercy. So it's very difficult to take them apart. But we will look and see what we can say. Heath Lambert said this about God's mercy and God's grace. He says, when we speak of God's mercy and grace, we are referring to God's kindness to undeserving people who need help. That's what it is. Um, I'm going to tell you a little story from my life. And I'm not at all telling you the story to say, oh, look at the nice thing I did. I'm telling you the story because this reminded me of God's mercy and grace to us. I mean, when Delilah was here, she said, I can look past my pain because I can remember Jesus' pain. That's the type of thing I'm talking about. Now, we live in a, in a complex, you might know or not know, and we have some wild goats and wild dogs running around there. And um, I hit one of the dogs on Friday. Now, I'm saying this publicly on the record again. I was not guilty in hitting this dog. I didn't drive fast. I didn't drive into the dog on purpose. I was driving and from out of the grass, this little Dutchman came and ran straight in front of my wheel. And I hit it. And he ran away and I thought he was fine. And he ran and the lady fetched him and she went into the house and I thought, well, that's fine. And, and then I came to town because we had something on Friday afternoon. And then we were finished. I stopped there and I, and I went and I spoke to her and I said, how's the dog doing? And she said, you hurt my dog very badly. And I'm like, whoa. So firstly, the lawyer and me jumped up saying, I did not do anything wrong. I did, it's not my fault. Your dog was an error. Your dog should not be running around in the streets or in the road like this. And she said, I had to take him to the vet and they had to give him stitches and x-rays and this is the bill. And I can't get my dog back because I can't pay the bill. Now, at that moment, I can say, you deserve it. 
You deserve it. Your dog did this. Your fault that you don't have money. I don't, mean, I don't know why she had money. But you could have worked better with your money. I could have stood there and say, justice means you are right where you are. And walk away. And I would be in the right. But then that song came in my mind. That says, everyone needs compassion. The kindness of a Savior. And so, I paid the bill. I don't know how people with dogs make it. <laughs> and now I understand why vets drive around with very nice cars. <laughs> and I'm not saying any of this because, I, I mean, I was a struggle in me to, to get to that point. But what I showed her is a little drop of mercy and grace compared to the mercy and grace that God shows us. We spoke about God's wrath and His justice last time. We said, if it wasn't for Jesus, God can pitch up now and look at all of our lives. It doesn't matter how fancy you think you are or how good you think you are. And He can say, to hell with you. Literally, because you deserve it. That's just. And He will pour out His wrath on you and it will be right and it will be good and it will be deserved. But what we will hear today is that is not what happened. God made a way to help undeserving people. And so this is what we're going to do. So now let's just come back to these stones again. So if we want to try to break them apart, God's mercy is used for two different things in the Bible. It's either a manifestation of God's goodness to those who are in trouble, like you would have mercy ministries. We go and we help the poor. So that's the one way. And the other way it's used is God not punishing or treating someone like they are deserved. That's the other definition of mercy. Now grace again is undeserved favor, good treatment, gifts, good things from God. And so, looking at the two together, a nice way to think of it is that mercy is not giving someone the punishment they deserve, and grace is giving someone the goodness they don't deserve. Now, Deuteronomy there says, For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you, or destroy you, or forget the covenant that He swore to them. So, it's fair if God chooses to leave you. It's fair if God chooses to destroy you, but He gives you mercy because He remembers His covenant and He won't do it. That's mercy. Now grace again is for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God. Now in this world that we live in, everyone, everyone, everyone experiences God's mercy and grace to a certain extent. When evil people unbelievers do bad things in this world, there's not immediately a lightning bolt coming from the sky, hitting them right there, punishing them. A friend of mine from Durbanville, he went through a time when he grew up in the church and he was part of the teenagers and stuff, and he got a bit older and he realized, I don't think I want to go to church anymore. And he said the first Sunday he was so scared. He was so scared because this lightning bolt is going to come now and get him for sinning. And he realized, nah, nothing happened. It was fine. And the next Sunday also didn't go because God was merciful to him. God gave him, didn't treat him like he deserved. Now, like I said, evil, so evil people get God's mercy. Evil people even get God's grace, the good things. The Bible tells us the rain falls on the land of everyone. Unbelievers can have good friends, good family, good jobs, good food, good holidays, all those things. But we have to realize that all of it is a gift from God. And that is part of the terror of hell. Because hell is when all mercy and grace is withdrawn. So you have a lot of atheists and unbelievers at the moment who would say, I'm living without God and my life is fine. I don't have any problems. I don't know why you need this guide. Look at me, I've got a good job, I've got lots of money, lots of girlfriends, I'm good. What they don't realize is all those things are gifts from God. 
And the moment they step over into eternity, all of that will be taken away. And for eternity, there will not be a single good second in their lives. Not a single moment of grace. Not a single moment of mercy. So, we're going to read today about God's mercy and grace. And you can open your Bibles to Hebrews 4. We're going to read from verse 14 to verse 16. I encourage you to open your Bible so you can follow along and make notes and underline and all those things that help. But before we read together, let's just pray. Yes, Father, we thank you that we can open your word so that we hear from you. We don't want people's knowledge. We don't want people's wisdom. We want to hear from you what it means that you are merciful and gracious. So speak to us today, we pray in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Hebrews 4, from verse 14 to 16. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of God, grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So, again, what we said last week is that we, because God is just, we deserve wrath. Because God must do what is right, He must punish unbelievers. Now, if you disagree with me, please go and listen to last week's sermon that's on YouTube. But it would be wrong for God to one day come and pour mercy and grace on everyone for eternity. In the same way that it would be wrong for our court systems to just one day decide, we're not going to punish evil people anymore. We're not going to punish the government when they do bad things. We're not going to punish murderers when they do bad things. We're just going to show mercy and grace to everyone. It would be wrong. And God is not wrong. God does good things. And so it would be right for God to punish. Now, so how do we get there? How do we get from the fact that we deserve wrath, but we desire grace and mercy? How do we get there? Only through Jesus. Only through Jesus. Jesus was the one who paid that price, who took the wrath, and Luther talks about the great exchange. Jesus lived the perfect life to earn righteousness, to earn perfection, to earn eternity. We lived sin. We earned punishment. We earned wrath, all of that. And Jesus on the cross came and said, don't, don't you want to swap? I'll give you life. I'll give you eternity. I'll give you forgiveness. You give me that punishment. You give me that wrath. You give me all of that. And that's how we bring it. Hebrews 9 verse 22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. That's why Jesus had to die on the cross. The shedding of blood here refers to the death of an animal. Without the shedding of blood, without the shedding of someone's blood, when the Old Testament was an animal until Jesus came, and He was the perfect sacrifice, so that His perfect blood could be taken in to pay the price. And so because of that, we have the ability to enter grace and mercy for eternity. It's not automatic, but we have the ability to say, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to repent of my sins. I want to turn my back on my old life. I want to be your child. Forgive me. And then we receive that grace. Now let's look at the passage that Joel has read for us. Verse 14 says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Now in the Old Testament, what did the priest do when he had the blood? What did he pass through? The curtains. He went from the, through the holy to the holies of holies. So it's, what the writer here is saying, in the same way that that priest took the perfect blood into the area where he could ask for forgiveness, in the same way Jesus went to the heavens and asked and paid for the forgiveness of our sins. So, because um, we must remember that the temple is just a representation of the throne room in heaven. That was the model it was built on. And so, the deal is done. <laughs> um, God's wrath is not needed. Praise be to Jesus. Now, why would he then say, so let us hold fast to our confession? Why would he say that? 
What is our confession? Maybe we should start there. What is our confession? Maybe someone can tell me. Jesus is our Savior. I repented and I belong to Jesus. My faith is in Jesus. Now, we in our Western minds want to think confession as someone who goes and stands in court and says something with his lips that might be true or not. We don't know. We hope he's speaking the truth. That's not what this confession means. This is a life confession. This is a truth that flows out of my heart through my lips and saying, Jesus is my Lord. Now, why do we have to hold fast to it? Because the one who stands strong till the end will be saved. Many will say unto me, to me at that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do miracles in your name? And he says, go away from me, I did not know you. You did not know, I did not know you. Your confession wasn't real. You did not hold to your confession. And so the picture here is of someone who's being saved in the ocean. And the NSRI gets there and they throw that rescue boy to you. And you hold on to it. Now would it be great to just hold on to it and go, Oh good, I'm saved. And you let go again. You know, that's how some people want to do their Christianity. Oh, hell sounds terrible. I don't want to go there. Heaven sounds quite nice. What do I have to do? Oh, I've got to say this little prayer. Okay, Jesus forgives me. Cool. And I let go again. And I go back to my life. You're not saved if you let go of the rescue. But if through the power of Jesus, you cling to Him and say, Jesus, without you I'm nothing. Without you I'm going to hell. Save me. Take me to the end. Those are the people for whom Jesus went and paid that price. Now let's get to the next verse. Verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now why is this verse here? We initially come to Jesus for grace and mercy unto salvation. We initially came to Jesus because we are lost and we want to be saved, and in grace and mercy He saves us. But it doesn't end there. That's not all Jesus is willing to do for us in grace and mercy. There's more good news. It's like these infomercials. But don't wait. Don't call just yet. We're going to throw in some more good things. And the good thing is that Jesus' grace and mercy is available to you today. Now, even today, when you are here, Jesus knows you. He knows the areas you are weak in. He knows the areas that you are struggling. He knows how you are tempted. He knows how harsh and hard temptation is. Why? Because he went through the same things. This is a Jesus who can come and sit next to you and say, You know, I understand. I understand. But Lord, you cannot understand. You do not know the thoughts that's running around in my mind when these temptations come. Jesus said, I understand. In the wilderness, the Satan tempted me with power. I understand. He tempted me with luxuries and good things. I understand. And so we can come to a God for grace and mercy who understands us. And therefore, verse 16, that says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We draw near with confidence. What does it mean to draw near? It means to stop playing church. It means to stop playing Christianity. It means to stop ticking Christianity on the census form, and it means nothing. It means to sit before Jesus and say, Wow, you are amazing. The things you did for me, the things you are doing for me, you are so good. That's what it means to draw near, to cast off, to let go of what is behind, and run to Jesus and follow in his footsteps. Now, this confidence that we draw near is not confidence in us. I don't come because I'm something and I have confidence and I can come to the throne room. My confidence is in Jesus. That the moment I will stand there at the throne room, Jesus will be there. And He will tell the Father, I paid for that one. I paid for that child. That child is forgiven. So this is the good news. And so then we must go to the throne. And what will we find there? It says we receive mercy and find grace in time of need. Now let's ask this question. How do God's mercy and grace grow our strength and our hope? I, re I really hope you don't wonder about this question. This is an easy one. 
If all that I said is true, if Jesus undeservedly is willing to give you life eternal, if Jesus undeservedly is giving, willing to give you mercy today and grace today, isn't that hopeful? Doesn't that give you strength? So but the first one says this, and this is just a short list of so many things. My sins can be forgiven. I can have a relationship with God. I can spend eternity with Him in perfection. We live in a world of entitlement. We demand and we deserve. And we are far more interested in human rights than human obligations. And I think if you are ever involved in social WhatsApp groups or um, comments on Facebook, you will know. Everyone is an outrage because their rights are being done in. They don't get what they think they should be getting. Now, if your eyes are open to eternal truth, you know that's rubbish. I deserve nothing. I deserve wrath. I deserve punishment. But through Jesus, I can have peace. I can have forgiveness. And through Jesus, this is all available. And the second thing is this. If you need help today, you can approach the throne of grace for His abundant mercy and grace. So this is the question you have to answer yourself. What battle are you currently trying to win in your own strength? What are you currently facing that is getting you down and you've tried everything, but you haven't tried going to the throne of grace? You haven't let everything go and walked up to God and say, God, you need to take over. You need to help. Now, we ask for grace. We ask for good things. We, we ask for those things we don't deserve, but those things we need. But we can also ask for mercy. God, I messed up. I messed up terribly. Please make it right. Please fix this. Please show me your mercy. Don't treat me like I deserve. Show me your life. Show me your footsteps that I can walk in it. Now, conclusion. I'm going to end with a story. I'm sure many of you have heard me say this before. But this is a story you can hear every day. And it's someone that tried to explain vengeance, justice, mercy, and grace. Those four terms. Now he says, imagine someone comes into your house and he shoots your son. And he kills your son. Right there in front of you. There are witnesses there. Everyone knows. He shot him. He's dead. Now, in that moment, I can do vengeance. Now, what would vengeance be in that moment? I shoot him. <laughs> you shoot my son, I shoot you. That's vengeance. Now, what would justice be in that moment? Oh, the police. Come, sort this out. This guy must pay for what he did. Throw him in jail. We'll get all these witnesses together. We'll make sure, we'll get a good lawyer. We'll make sure that this guy pays for him what he did. Now that's justice. What is mercy? What is not treating the person like they deserve? That would be to tell the person, go. Just go. We forgive you, but we don't want to see you. Just get out of here. We're not going to phone the police. We're not going to do anything. We'll forgive you, but get out of our sight. That's mercy. And you know what grace is? Grace is to say, I forgive you. And you know what? A room just opened up in my house because my son is not here anymore. Don't you want to become my son? Can't I treat you with goodness? Now you will ask, who would do that? God did. The Father did. He could have done revenge. Day one, Adam and Eve, poof, that's it, finished. He could have waited for justice. Let them live their lives. Let them carry on. Judgment is coming. They'll all stand there and they'll all pay. I'll make them pay. He could have had mercy. Okay, I'll forgive you, but just get out of my sight. Let's go live by yourself. I don't want to see you ever again. I'm not going to give you any of my goodness. Go try by yourself. But he chose grace. We were the reason his son was killed. And he said, don't you want to become my children? This is powerful stuff. My desire with the series was that 
you develop your walk with this God who is willing to show grace. Many false Christs will come. Many false images of Christ will come. Um, if you want to find out who God isn't, read the newspaper what they say about God. The truth is in the Word. The truth is about who God told us He is. But now, we need to respond. And Joel says this. Joel 2 verse 12 to 13. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. That's what it means to come to the throne. Return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts, not your garments. Don't come with a fake repentance. Don't come with a show for the world to see. Come with your heart broken. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and He relents over disaster. There is still time. There's still time. We don't know for how long, and I don't think it's for much longer. But there is still time to come to this throne and receive mercy and grace. Let's pray together. Who is like you, O God? Who is like you? The world has designed so many gods, so many idols, and none of them know grace. None of them show grace. You are the only one that says, come undeserved and receive eternal life. Who is like you? Lord, we are so thankful for that because if we had to wait for the day that we were good enough to come, we would never come. If we were to wait for the day where we not only stopped for our sins, but paid all our sins and, and not being any future sins, we would never be able to come. But you invite us into your grace. You invite us and say, come just as you are, and I will make you, I will change you. Just repent. Just admit you were wrong. Just admit that you're a sinner. And come and ask for forgiveness. And I will give you life. I will give you hope. I will give you forgiveness. I will give you a father. I will give you a family. I will give you eternity. Lord, you are good. Who is like you? Help us, Lord, that this series is stuck in our minds whenever we fall on our knees before you to pray. So that we see you as this God when we pray. Help us that when we read the word, that we will not be skewed by a wrong image of you, but that we see this God who is just and wrathful and gracious and merciful and inf infinite and all-knowing and all these wonderful things we learned about you. Help us to know it when we spend time with you, that this is our God. This is our God. And so Lord, we thank you for that in the wonderful name of Jesus, because only through Jesus all of this is possible. And so we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Merciful.